It's a particularly great joy today to welcome Shannon Ziegler, who is the executive director of the Brehm Center for Worship, Theology, and the Arts at Fuller Seminary as our guest on Conversing. Shannon has been serving in this role over the last while at Fuller and has been bringing to it a set of gifts that don't often come together. She is on, on the one hand, an outstanding administrative and I would say cr critically sensitive leader. Uh, critical in the sense that she brings a, an acute eye to the work that she does and a leader who knows how to build a community and lovingly, compassionately, and creatively work with people. Those are combinations of gifts that don't always come together. When you add to it that she's also an artist and also a person with a great concern for the arts in the life of the church and the people of God and in the world, uh, it's a, a particularly great fit. And for all those reasons and more, I'm delighted that she's our guest today. Welcome, Shannon. Thank you very much, Mark. You know, it really is an amazing journey because often administrative gifts and artistic gifts just do not really come together. And also uh, the <laughs> vision of those things in relationship to the arts more generally, arts culture, uh, arts realities, artists. Um, and then you add the layer of the church in light of all of those things. That's quite a convergence that we're talking about. So sort of explain how those things come together in, in you. Sure, sure. It, it is. It's a journey. It's a meandering journey for me. My um, my kind of vocational journey has not been a straight line in any sense of the word. Um, however, from from my youngest years, I have both felt a draw to the Lord, um, uh, perhaps an ab abnormal draw. Um, I was the one in my family who they always sensed they needed to give Bibles to at every birthday and <laughs> things, <laughs> things like this. Uh, additionally, I was always making something. Um, both my parents are creative uh, or artists in some capacity. My sister is an art teacher. My aunt was an art teacher. So the arts have a rich heritage in my family lineage as well. Um, and so throughout uh, my growth and life, I have sought to integrate my faith with my art because well, I had sought to find places of integration in the world, I think is a more accurate statement because they felt so integrated in me. Um, and I know that's not always the case for creative people of faith, uh, but for me, that always seemed to be true. And um, as my call developed, I realized that I, I really wanted to help other people not just understand that about themselves, but articulate it and then feel sent out into the right. world in, in powerful ways. And so that's where the administrative gifts, I think, kicked in. For a really long time, I would not admit that I actually really love charts and spreadsheets. Um, <laughs> and in fact, I do. I, I um, If you follow me on Instagram, you'll see that I just made a chart for my flower garden um, that I'm making nice. out in the yard. So <laughs> yes. it's, it's a part of my life, um, for better or for worse. And um, in some days it feels really bipolar and in other days it feels um, just like a natural flow from um, organized organization structure and strategy to um, painting a new painting um, or exploring a creative concept. And so um, my journey took me numerous places. Um, after college, uh, I was very involved with campus ministry there and the arts in many ways. Uh, and then um, took a period of discernment for about a year and then ended up in seminary myself, um, attended Asbury Seminary. And um, fortunately, there was given a lot of space to really explore my call. And it, it was pretty quick to realize I didn't fit into the typical seminary boxes. Um, I, I did not, I wasn't called to be a missionary. I wasn't called to be a children's minister and certainly not a head pastor. Preaching was very scary to me at that point. Um, but I, I believe it was our provost at the time, um, Joel Green, actually, who we know very well here now, um, who said, you know, you could, you could go the academic route and study art and beauty and theology. And, um, this was the first time someone had said that to me. And so, um, meanderingly as it happened, uh, I'm finally doing that, that academic work and, um, and working on a PhD right now as well. So, um, Previous to coming to Fuller, I worked for Christians in the visual arts. Um, I've also been involved in community arts in multiple places that I've lived across the U.S., um, smaller nonprofit arts organizations, um, and then in my own church serving in, on arts committees and such over the years. So um, it feels like a real privilege to be at Fuller 
for such a time as this in a role um, like the Brim Center. Well, you've been received well and enthusiastically. I, I don't normally ask people to explore their PhD topics on conversion <laughs> because it sometimes feels as though it's not right the, the best way in. But in this case, I think your your project, which you were telling me briefly about, sounds like one that I'd, I'd like you to share a little bit more about. What What are you working on? Of course, and if people if people turn off the podcast right right now, I'm going to blame you and not me. <laughs> um, so I am a lifelong Wesleyan. I grew up in the Methodist Church, married to a Methodist pastor's son, who's also ordained as a Methodist pastor. And for that reason, I'm very interested in John and Charles Wesley. Um, Charles Wesley now has come to feel like a friend to me. Uh, I am writing about him in my dissertation, but rather than positioning him, looking at him only through his poetry or his hymns, I'm looking at him as an artist in his identity. And um, people have not explored him this way in the past. Um, I'm looking at his more recently published journals um, to explore, kind of get more into his psyche and his understanding of himself as a creative person, specifically the particularly Wesleyan understanding of salvation and um, how Charles Wesley's understanding of salvation does or does not promote freedom in his creative practice. Uh, And then eventually, I would hope that there would be some practical implications that would come out of this for artists in the church today. Right. It's a great topic. And as an example of believing, as, as I think we have to be honest about, that theology matters. And sometimes it matters intentionally and constructively. And sometimes it matters deconstructively or unhelpfully. And uh, so I think using someone like Charles Wesley as a focus is a, is a perfect example of that. You know, I want to go back for a moment to just think about the Brem Center that you're now leading. When this was founded by Bill and Dee Brem, it was founded really with a, with a central passion. And it was really a passion that, that Bill, who was the leader of, uh, of a defense contracting company in Washington, D.C. area, also had a great love of Christ, great love of the church, and a great love of music in particular. And he and Dee shared all these things in common. And their concern was that there was this often apparent disconnection between the preaching person and the music person, that they didn't seem to coordinate in the most basic way very well together. And they certainly didn't work in an integrated way in which the ministry of each could come together. So as a person working in a very challenging industry uh, and then also bringing together a passion for the faith and a passion for the arts and a passion for uh, preaching, uh, all of these things came together and they uh, were were introduced to Fuller through Bill's invitation to come and speak to the board about nuclear disarmament. And, uh, And it was out of that, as I understand the story, that the relationship began to develop. And then eventually uh, he was asked to join the board. And it was during the time that he was serving on the board that uh, he and he gave the resources that made the Brem Center p- uh, possible. And their love, their vision, their generosity, their creativity. But in addition to all those qualities, it's also been their patience, their willingness to let Fuller curate a complicated, rich vision that is really needed at Fuller and it's needed beyond Fuller in the life of the church and beyond the church in the, in the context of society and culture. That patience has given Fuller a chance to mature and develop in ways that have been amazing. And the Brems have really set the stage for this. And I, I know that you've gotten acquainted with them since you've taken on this job as, as executive director, but at, at this moment, how do you think the work that you're seeing ties in with their original vision? Yeah, that's a really great question. And it's one I've been asking myself and I've asked them. Uh, In fact, Bill still has an assignment out for me, (laughs) which I will remind E&D about. I asked where he saw the Brim Center in 10 years from now. Um, So this year, part of the reason we're having this conversation right now is that this year is the 20 year anniversary of the founding of the Brim Center. Uh, a report was written 10 years ago celebrating the 10 years that I just finished reading for the second time today. And so now I'm thinking about the next 10 years and how that arc all ties together. Um, 
one of the things I really love about Bill and Dee both um, is their commitment to going big or going home. Um, and Bill, when I've talked to him and the stories that others have told me about both of them is this expansive and integrated vision for worship theology and the arts. Uh, one of the things they told me on our first call last year was, you know, worship is not just for pastors and art is not just for artists. And um, Fuller is not just to equip head pastors. And um, that's been in the vision of Fuller from the beginning to equip um a diverse understanding of what it is to minister in the world. And so uh, that and the commitment to um, high quality music, um, to be honest with you, and that legacy has been carried on um, by Ed Wilmington very well. And so I, I am existing, I have come into the Brim Center in this, this middle space between all of this history and what is to come. Uh, so we have... Um, we have several folks who have been here since the beginning that will be leaving soon um, for retirement. And so we're looking forward to um, how do we carry on the legacy of those people, both in music, choral direction, composing, theology, um, the sacraments, all of these spaces. So the connection of um, Bill and Dee's vision, I think the, the key, uh, the word that keeps resonating with me is the word integration. Um, we're not just a center for worship. We're not just a center for art. Um, we're a center for the integration of those two. And I think that's what makes us special and even different from other centers that are doing similar work right now. Um, wonderful work. Um, but our sweet spot it's really in that nexus, in the thin slice of the Venn diagram where those two things overlap. You know, the generative idea of the Brem Center really came from uh, from Bill and Dee Brem. But the earliest formation involved some of Fuller's faculty, and it also involved uh, two people who were absolutely seminal to the development of the Brem Center, Fred and Dottie Davison, who, who because of their creativity, their deep dedication, Fred's musical gifts, their side-by-side -side labors to help bring to birth really this thing called the Brem Center, the, the incredible work that they did for all the years they served in those roles was just really quite remarkable. I, I think it was also an amazing season when Mako Fujimura was the director of the Brem Center because Mako, uh, as both artist and philosopher, uh, brought to something in the Brem Center that we'd never had before, which was an, an artist who was actually creating visual art. In Fred's case, it had been music. In in Mako's case, it became visual art. And his studio became a context for what he referred to as, as Brem or Fujimura Fellows, which then became a fellowship of people that were at Fuller or related to the, to the Brem Center who brought their amazing artistic gifts and experiments together in a way that is a kind of communion that I hope for those who are involved in it will, will always uh, continue. And now under your leadership, we're entering a new phase. But I just think that arc is really all together. It includes so many people that could be named and, uh, and a, really a kind of pantheon of, of people who, as you know, have made such contributions. It's so, it's so very true. And, I feel so privileged. One of the most amazing parts of my job in this first two years has been getting to know um, those heritage holders. And um, I finally got to have a call with Fred and um, I had heard so many stories about Fred and Dottie and um, we had an hour and a half long conversation and decided nice. decided we should be friends. And I think um, he, you know, he is continuing to enjoy life and grandkids and retirement and they have a small farm. But he told me so many wonderful stories of his time there. That first 10 years of very generative um, birthing time for the Brim Center. Um, I've known Mako for several years as well. And um, really wonderful to the first time I toured his studio was just in awe and um, getting to spend time and get to know some of the students that were his fellows has been a real privilege and many of them still very involved in the Brim Center. And I think the legacy he leaves behind is that um, 
deeper, more philosophical perspective, the, that wisdom um, that roots us in the process of making and the value of making for the church um, and for people who would consider themselves non-makers. Um, I think I think we all are, are called to that space in many ways. Um, and now looking into the future, really asking myself, um, what is it I am called to bring here? Um, and who who are the partners? Um, who are the partners that are going to make that happen? And I know that I have learned already from our previous directors and um, we're looking toward the future. We're already seeking out new studio spaces. We're already um, learning from the wisdom of the past. And um, I just hope that I can can bring a special piece to the journey as well. One of the favorite phrases I remember Bill saying many times is, let's start with the universe. Hmm. <laughs> And that sounds right. <laughs> exactly. It sounds right. That's that's Bill and Dee's spirit and and mind and heart and their theology and their sense of how the world exists and what makes it go around and the God that they worship and all of that. And I think one of the things that uh, that has been so wonderful about the Brehm Center has been that it's like a it's like a collection of people who give themselves to the nurturing of Christian imagination. And that needs to happen in all the disciplines across Fuller. But how does that distill itself now across the array of things? You might just name briefly the, the sure. sectors of, of what's encompassed in the Brehm Center so that people can have a clear picture of that. Sure, that's a great question uh, that that will carry us forward into another, another space too. Um, so historically, as I mentioned, Bill and Dee's passion was really for worship and music and um, friends with Fred Bach, Fred and Lewis Bach. And uh, we now have an initiative in the Brim Center named after Fred Bach in honor of him and his choral direction um, in two major churches in the Los Angeles area for many, many years. Um, so that's that's one segment is worship and music excellence. Um, we additionally have an area focused on film, um, formerly called Real Spirituality. We just did a big rebrand um, and it's now called Brim Film. And it um, has a longer history than the Brim Center itself. In fact, it, it predates the Brim Center by a couple of years. And um, Rob Johnson is always very quick to remind me of that, that his initiative is older than the Brim Center itself, <laughs> and which is very important. And I think what that really shows is the deep value of storytelling um, right. for the faith formation of believers and pastors. Uh, we also have um, visual arts initiatives that have happened over the years that were founded by Bill Durness, and um, he's retired now, but he was a prominent mentor for me for a long time as well. I'm, I'm a visual artist myself. Um, the Ogilvy Institute of Preaching is a big part of the Brim Center, which is, Mark, where you first right, that came, was my came, point. Right. came into the Brim Center, close to your heart. Um, now led by Jennifer Ackerman, who is, is brilliant, has a heart for justice and preaching. Um, the MICA groups that are a part of the Ogilvy Institute are thriving and have grown all over the U.S. and beyond. So these four areas really have been a part of the history of the Brim Center for quite some time. And... Um, part of what we're working toward in this this new season, where we're thinking towards our next 20 years, is how can these uh, four brilliant areas of focus start to partner and integrate with one another um, and to think creatively about how we all serve the church together through visual art, through film, through preaching and through music. Um, as Bill talked about, as you mentioned, it part of the reason the center was founded was because preachers didn't talk to music pastors. But what if preachers also talked to visual artists and filmmakers and um, they had each other's numbers programmed into their phone and imagine what kind of good work could come out of that kind of collaboration and integration, both in the church and in the culture. Well, and that's where you've stood in that very intersection prior to coming to Brem and now as the leader of Brem. And it's part of why I think there's been such enthusiastic response to your leadership besides your just God-given gifts and abilities. It's also the fact that you represent and occupy the space that you're inviting other people into in which this kind of conversation that you're just describing is not only possible, but it's really generative, it's creative, it's life-giving, it's the source of hope uh, and and the cultivation of imagination, Christian imagination. So just talk a little bit about, as you've taken stock of these things and recently rebranded, take us into those things that you imagine putting into your answer to Bill Brem about what you think uh, the next 10 years 
uh, should look like? What are some of the things that you really would m- be most passionate about seeing mm-hmm. develop? Mm-hmm. So hearkening back to this report that I reread, um, one of the metaphors that came up in, in the interviews that this student did 10 years ago, uh, and my, my father is a hunter. I'm from the South. So this made sense to me, but he talks about, or she talks about the difference between buck shot and um, a rifle shot. And so the buck shot scatters everywhere um, and the rifle shot is, is more focused. And so uh, the Brim Center has historically been um, a really phenomenal talent show of sorts uh, where we have said yes to almost everything because the people knocking on our door with ideas were extremely talented and had excellent ideas. And um, in the first generation of the Brim Center, this is exactly what we needed to be doing, in my opinion. And others would probably say the same thing. We were experimenting. We were trying to figure out our place in the church landscape, in the cultural landscape, in the evangelical landscape, and bringing all the best people to the table. Um, and 10 years ago, um, it came to light that we were doing lots of things pretty well, but it might be better if we did fewer things truly with excellence um, and figured out where our real niche was. And so my answer to your question about the next 10 years is really that thin slice of the Venn diagram. Yeah, It's really where that integration happens. And not just integration for the sake of integration, but integration for the sake of the church of the future. Um, we're in the midst of this pandemic. Hopefully we are on our way out of it. Um, but as we all know, as Andy Crouch pointed out to us, year and a half ago, um, things are not going to return to what we knew as normal. And so what does that mean for churches? What does that mean for the art world, for the film industry, for all the places that Christian artists and ministers occupy? Um, And how do we minister in a more holistic way with the discipleship of all of our senses, not just our minds? And um, I haven't answered your question very concretely. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) I've answered it very abstractly, but I think we're working as a Brim Center team right now to develop a rubric. And here's where my spreadsheet side comes in again to say what types of programs meet the pain points of those we're trying to serve um, and do so in collaboration with worship theology and arts. Um, and so, th- and the people represented in those three spheres and not just one. Uh, right. And, and so I think when we work together in that way, we're able to offer not just theologies, but practices that can help those in leadership all over the world in these areas. Right. Well, I just know that as a pastor, uh, blessed in a church in Berkeley with a lot of creative people, that I would say my pastoral ministry was unlocked by different kinds of people in the congregation, but the artists were among the most important groups. And, And it was not because of quote, Art Sunday, let's call it, or something right. something like that. It was about a way of seeing and a way of engaging and a way of bringing together the passion of, a let's say, a liturgical season and all of its richness, but all of its richness in really physical, embodied, ethnic, cultural, g- gendered, emotional, visual, musical formats, right? And, and for me, that felt like being handed a hundred crayon box where uh, people that actually knew what to do with these materials could actually bring things together. And I, as a pastor, could enter into the conversation with artistic sensibilities, but they were the artists. And I, I, I just know that my mind and my creativity was just unlocked by their influence on me. And uh, I, I just know how significant this is because it recast in many ways, subtle in some places and much more obvious than others, the, the spaciousness that was needed for the whole human experience to be able to come to worship, to be able to come to, com- to our sense of community together, to the communion table. Um, one of the most amazing things that happened was uh, a woman who is really a, a floral liturgical artist who uh, had never really been invited in that way to bring her actual artistry to the liturgical rhythms of the year and to sort of set the stage um, Sunday by Sunday, season by season, 
was just amazing. And, and it became a focus um, in, in a way that was not just, as it were, having memorial flowers on the table, if you want to sure. put it in its worst category. Right. But, in, but instead uh, saw it as, as a way of entering, helping the congregation bring their whole selves to worship. So as you think about trying to influence pastors, just using that as one of the audiences of the Brem Center, how would you describe the hopes you would have for pastors if they were to really experience what the Brem Center might be imagining bringing to them? Sure. Um, prior to my job as the executive director, I worked for the Brim Center in one of our satellite areas in Seattle. And um, we started an artist residency in Seattle that it really was passed down from a wonderful pastor and friend named Brian Moss. Um, and what the residency seeks to do is to build a meaningful and reconciliatory, reconciliatory relationship between artist and congregation. Um, and not just artists and congregation, but one specific artist and specific members of a congregation um, that both might be changed. And um, it is often the case that a head pastor or an associate pastor or a worship pastor would be our primary liaison with that artist in residence. And what we really believed made that program work was relationship. Um, and Mark, I know that you that you understand this deeply with your deep friendship with Mako and other artists. And there's something transformative that happens when you're in deep relationship with a creative person and you learn how to see differently and hear differently and taste differently, or maybe see in a way for the first time. Um, right. And your theology is shaped by this. And um, artists, simply by being in relationship together, the world that they live in, the culture of their minds is different um, than many others. And when we allow artists to be truly integrated into our church communities and not tokenized, um, we have a deep opportunity to see the world and to see the Lord and the kingdom in a different and new way. And um I also think it goes both ways. There's a mutual hospitality that has to take place. Um, I deeply believe artists need the liturgy, for example. Um, I believe that the liturgy creates spacious places for creative minds, um, where otherwise we get overwhelmed and feel isolated. Um, Artists easily plunge to the depths of places, um, which isn't always bad. I, I believe that's a call sometimes, but community um, and the word of God and the liturgy, in my opinion, are what tether us and bring us back to that anchor in that community. Right. Um, right. It is amazing uh, if we think as, for example, Mako and, and many people over the millennia have said that God is the artist, that is the center out of which all of creation has arrived, but also out of which we have each been knit together in our mother's wombs. And as communities call together through Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that is an act of God making us into a communion of unlike people who find one another in this unexpected way, in ways that our sociology wouldn't help us find each other, but which our uh, common communion does. And I think one of the roles of arts that uh, that has been quite striking to me is that it's it's what I think of as some of the best oblique ways of communicating the gospel. Uh, oblique in the sense that fine art, good art, doesn't tend to hit you straight on. It hits you right. slant. Um, but it also is the kind of art that, that therefore allows people who could be deep insiders or complete outsiders who somehow encounter it and they're invited and they know when they've experienced that they're invited and therefore right. that they have a sense of belonging. It creates, it creates a, not a decorative element uh, that's way too uh, limited and potentially cheesy way of understanding it. <laughs> it's, it's instead, it's actually a form of deep hospitality that sends up a signal that says you are invited all the way into this mm -hmm. place mm -hmm. and that you get to bring the whole of who you mm -hmm. are. That's a pretty remarkable role. 
there's an immersion and a messiness that's required for conversion in, in many ways yes. to the arts. Yes. And I had an experience. Um, my husband got his PhD in Boston. So we lived there for a while and we went to an Anglican church there. And there are a lot of MIT folks, engineers, former military Calvinists, no offense, <laughs> very head, head knowledge people. Um, and our priest asked me to... Sounds like a true Wesleyan. I know, I know, I know. Yeah. I know. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, it, our priest asked me to lead an art experience at a retreat that we had for our church. So we're at this abbey in Hingham, Massachusetts. The, the nuns allowed us to use their beautiful chapel. It was a chapel in the round and it had, it was wood everywhere. So it was this beautiful light wood that glowed in the sunlight and um, we had fundraised for quite some time. I had just had my son. So I was thinking a lot about play, uh, first time mom. And this idea, this image came to my mind when I saw the chapel where we were going to be being um, and of these building blocks, just the standard wood building blocks, the same tone as the wood in the chapel. So we fundraised because they're kind of expensive um, for six months and had 4,500 children's wood building blocks um, for 20 parishioners in this chapel. And we had three hours and um, they could build whatever they wanted to. So we essentially created an art installation around the communion table with wood building blocks. The only rule I gave them was by the end of the three hours, everything had to touch and it had to surround the table. So um, there were children, five-year-olds and there were 90-year-olds, truly. Um, and this was an experience like you describe, where people, I heard them complaining as they entered the chapel, like, do we have to do this? Like three hours is a really long time. I want to go study the word of God. Like, why well, don't want to do this? And then they left, um, many of them converted um, to a deeper experience of, of worship as play um, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. embodiment in community. Um, right, right. What an amazing experience. It was fun. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I do think, you know, it's interesting. I want to develop that theme of play because often the seriousness of even the word worship uh, often excludes play because it's thought to be beneath the category of, of worship. Whereas if you read the Psalms, for example, through the lens of play, you have a strong sense that there's every mood, for, for one thing, every kind of concern, both anger, rage, uh, vengeance, and joy, celebration, yeah. delight, wonder, awe. And there is in that whole spectrum, this invitation to a humanity that, that also does include play. Um, and talk a little bit more about that, about the making aspects of play. Sure. Um, that particular season of my life, I was thinking a lot about play. I, um, I was a mother not by surprise, but but by surprise, because I think you can't become a parent without being surprised. And so I realized how overly serious I was in, in my life and in my faith. And uh, my son taught me how to play again uh, in many ways. I've He's nine now. He turns nine in two weeks or 10 in two weeks. Um, and he keeps my husband and I from getting too serious about theology about church. Um, when you have two seminarians married to one another, it can be really problematic, um, <laughs> especially two liturgists. So yeah. Um, in terms of play in the seminary environment, I think, um, I think it's essential to theological formation. And it, in many cases, we forget that, um, as pastors, as academics, um, Artists understand it better, I think. And, right. and even even when artists start to take our art too seriously, it, it usually makes the art worse. Um, I've right. seen, seen a number of artists get stuck um, and then have to retreat back to earlier forms of art making, um, even from, from their childhood experiences. Um, use new materials step outside the box, um, how many different um, cliches can I throw out? But um, reverting in many ways back to play can be a much more um, freedom inducing and perhaps even um, mature choice sometimes mm -hmm. then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an unlocking experience, right? Play, especially for adults, unlocks the things that 
are native to us, but which we've stowed away often for various cultural or generational or other kinds of reasons. Academic. <laughs> yes, academic <laughs> reasons. Yeah, it just gets pushed away. Play has a way of uh, inviting us to take risks. And I do think one of the categories of worship that uh, has been captivating to me um, is really how do you cultivate through worship capacity for God's people to take risks. Uh, so the book that I wrote, The Dangerous Act of Worship, is really based on a kind of theology of risk taking yeah. that you that it's dangerous to worship uh, in the sense that there is something really at play, literally, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that it is worth putting at play, right. and that the goal is not control. The goal is actually surrender and right. offering and and uh, a lot of wider vocabulary categories than I think I would have typically used earlier in yeah. my life. That's that's very true, and I think. Um, I had the privilege in my seminary experience to be a part of our, what we called the worship design team. Um, and, and the same thing is happening at Fuller right now. Right. With the, the chapel team led by Julie Ty and Ed Wilmington and Todd Johnson. And uh, every time I attend, attend a chapel service now online, I am overwhelmed by the creative energy in the space. Yes. And, it, and it's not creativity for the sake of itself. No. It's creativity for the worship of the Lord. And I, always encounter the Holy Spirit, yes. even on Zoom, uh, because I think they have found a way to work together that unleashes freedom and invites the Spirit in. Yes. It's a yes. really, really beautiful thing. Yeah, I, I agree completely. And one of the best things I think that's happening at Fuller involves the way that the worship team here does invite us into this space together as a community. And the deeper we can go in that, the more we meet each other, the more we meet God, the more we can be surprised by the things that come out of out of really purposeful, not self-indulgent, not narcissistic, not uh, uh, not self-serving uh, creativity, but creativity offered to the community for the sake of welcome, hospitality, engagement, um, yeah. both with the word of God and with the community of God's people. Very, yeah. very profound, yeah, remarkable gifts. Shannon, one of the things that you've said is that beauty matters now more than ever. I completely agree for my own sense of reasons, but I, I'd love for you to unpack why that is and what that means for you. Sure. Um, of course, a riff on beauty will save the world. Um, but I do think now more than ever with the state of the world and where we find ourselves as a nation and as, as a world. And um I put that on the cover of our fundraising brochure this year, hoping that others would resonate with that statement as well and come behind our mission and vision. But one thing really to clarify, when I talk about beauty with others, particularly in church circles, I, I really want to clarify what that means for me, because I know that it's a hot topic in the church. It's also a hot topic uh, in the art world in that we've rejected the concept of traditional beauty in the art world in many ways. And, um, but I think what we see in the incarnation life, death and resurrection of Jesus is that beauty is not always beautiful. Uh, beauty is not always balance and harmony and pleasantness to the eyes. Um, beauty can involve deep contrast and dis dissonance because it represents our salvation, really. Um, the, the beauty of the cross is a very real thing. And uh, in some of my doctoral research, um, I've been reading different concepts of beauty, philosophical, theological, and otherwise. And I still come back to something Deborah Sokolov said. She was at, at director of the Luce Center at Wesley Seminary for quite some time. And she talks about beauty um, through the lens of the Trinity and beauty as relational theology, um, whether that is between artist and viewer, viewer and another viewer, viewer and painting an artist, um, worship leader and worshiper. There's so many different relationships you could think about in, in the art and faith world, but um, the beauty resides in the connection and the overlap Um of people and ideas and personalities and um, not always in harmony and balance and order. Um, David Bentley Hart does something similar in his work with concepts of, of philosophical beauty. Um, and I think when we start thinking that way, um, art and beauty and creativity 
force us into spaces of relationship. And if we stay in spaces of relationship long enough, we're asked questions of reconciliation. Um, And that is really what I mean by um, our world needs beauty now more than ever. So let me ask you an, an applied question about that. Is there such a thing or should there be such a thing as a beautiful sermon? Yes, and, and, absolutely. And what is that? That's a great question. Um, I have always loved, um, personally, short homiletic theatrical sermons deeply rooted in the narrative of the Bible. And so I think um, I go to an Anglican church right now, and typically our pastors preach from the lectionary. And uh, when I am most wild and would say it's beautiful is when there is a deep connection between Old and New Testaments. And when you begin to have these glimpses of the kingdom of God for that reason. So there is this storytelling in 15 minutes, which is a miracle in and of itself, Um, Because if you go past that, I'm like, not with you anymore. (laughs) But there's the storytelling that captures the whole arc of salvation, um, but connects us to people in a time so very different than our own. And I think when when those two things come together and then we can see the reflection of Christ in our own lives, um, it's a really beautiful thing. And it's it's not always harmonious. It gets loud and soft and dissonant. And um, we ride that ride and... It's for our good. Right. I, I wonder if you can just tell us a little bit about what you think uh, about this part of the Brem Center. One of the things that I think has overflowed through the work of people like Rob Johnston and others, especially in relationship to film, is the way that Fuller has manifested what I think has been part of its instincts for a long time, which is an openness toward culture. Yeah. So instead of being an evangelicalism that's closed like a, a circle of right. uh, of some kind that doesn't allow access. Instead, Fuller's kind of orthodoxy has been a confident orthodoxy that, that opens its arms and its mind, its actual curiosity, its generativity toward understanding and seeing the world. How does, how does that part of, of the Brem Center perhaps unfold in the years to come, do you think? I was just thinking about this this morning, um, the sort of open and bounded sets idea. Um, right. And Fuller, um, to me, even before I was a part of this community, has always stood for um, both a rootedness and an expansion. And um, that's a really special thing that a lot of seminaries have not been able to hold together. Um, I I think Fuller is deeply orthodox in the truest definition of the word. We hold to the cores of the gospel. Right. um, While not being afraid of the wild edges of culture. Right, Um, right. We are comfortable going there. And um, I love that. I I love what you do in this podcast. I love what Fuller Studio does in this arena and the magazine. I love the engagements with difficult films through our film initiative. Um, I love the conversations that we've been having on race in the midst of all the turmoil in our country. All of these difficult conversations have found a home here and um, I think actually are a part of our DNA from the very beginning as a seminary. And the Brem Center, I think, in that desire to find that slice of integration also seeks to continue to offer maybe even more because we are an arts organization, the risk taking of going out to the edges and to the margins um, while also knowing that, that the Lord is with us and um, we are rooted in in the depths of the gospel uh, and the hope that that brings. And so, yes, we can want to continue to expand and to think big. I know, I don't know if I can say this out loud, but there's been very preliminary conversation about an MFA program coming out of the Brem Center one day, perhaps. Um, so those sort of dreams of engaging culture in um, not trivial ways, but deep and real ways are, are a part of our heritage, I think, and particularly meaningful being in Los Angeles, too. Right. You know, it's been really fun for me over the time that I've been at Fuller that I've had this opportunity to have a friendship with uh, Lauren Buckman, who's the president of Art Center College of Design here in Pasadena. And he had me on his podcast recently and nice. I just this, uh, <laughs> this week did a podcast with him 
And in both of our respective podcasts, he coming out of a, a Jewish background and, and me obviously coming out of a Christian uh, commitment, we had conversations about the relationship between spirituality and creativity and making, because uh, like Mako Fujimura's recent book called Art and Faith, uh, Lauren Buckman has written a book that comes out in the fall that's called Make to Know. And it's really exploring these same kinds of themes around how the making and the knowing of something comes together. And, and in his case, as the leader of a secular art school, arguably one of the best ones in the country, uh, that for him to be sensitive to the spiritual dimensions of making comes very much out of his own religious background. And it comes out of a shared background because of the Hebrew scriptures. It comes out of a shared kind of theology of the nature of the world and the nature of God's being and so forth. Um, but I, I was just struck by how much cultural conversation there is opportunity for if we can see that there's an expansiveness to the character of God right. uh, that's not therefore losing its particularity in Jesus Christ, right. but actually through that particular door, God creates a pathway into an enlarged heart, mind, soul, and strength for the sake of the larger purposes that God is bringing about. And, and I've always loved that Fuller has this capacity to engage culture. And, and yet, as you know, and this is what I'd like you to comment on, we're in such a bizarre cultural inflection moment where the nature of cultures right now, it feels like one of the main categories is collision and uh, violence at times, and uh, certainly racial, ethnic, class, gender struggles of so many different right. kinds. Um, if, if, if the Bram Center could be a catalyst for culture, how would you see that potentially unfolding? That is a great question. Uh, I, when you were saying clash, um, I immediately thought we're clashing because we're being asked to be disembodied um, in, in many ways. Um, Ooh, tell us more about that. What does that mean? Uh, black and brown bodies uh, are are continuing to be um, murdered, traumatized right. in, in a number of ways, as we all know. Um, and you know the the whole movement of all lives matter and the pushback um, in this area it really disembodies the embodiment of black people and right. people and white people. I think we are we all lose um, when we discount the other and right. um, the arts. Um, from a theological perspective, are deeply rooted in the incarnation, the embodiment of God as man. And because of this, we believe these things matter. And so I think even the shootings yesterday um, in the... You're referring to the shootings in, in Atlanta. That that's right. In the massage parlor um, right. appear, to be, appear to be racially motivated and deeply related to bodies um, right. in, in many ways. And so... Um, Asian the bodies, Brims women's bodies, right? That's right. Yeah. And um, I think as a center for worship in the arts, we have a deep call to continue to remember the importance of people's bodies, not just in the worship space, but out in the world, living our lives. Um, I have even personally experienced in, in this season um, of Zoom, um, all I want to do when I get off of a day of calls is go in the garden um, or paint and um I was talking to a friend about this. I was like, I don't really know why. And she said, well, because you haven't been in your body all day. It's like, oh, you're right. I haven't been and or exercise. Like it's one of right. those three things that I feel a deep, a deep need to do. And I think that's a trivial example compared to um, those in our cities and in our towns that are crying out um, for the deliverance of their bodies and their identities. And so right. the arts, um, have always been prophetic, um, will continue to be prophetic and will continue to be a means to call that out in culture. And people of faith have a deep responsibility to be involved in, in that mission. And I, I frankly don't think the church generally has done a great job. Um, and I hope that the Brim Center can be a catalyst for change in churches and equipping churches to um, 
name this value as well as in the culture itself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's uh, a great shortfall of some Christian theologies that specialize so much in spiritual theology that they forget about physical theology that involves this incarnated God. And uh, awkwardly and wonderfully, that's the center of our faith. And uh, and yet it does set up challenges and opportunities that the church has tried to skirt, I think, often by saying and staying in safer spaces. But if you're going to work together, or as we were talking about a minute ago, play together, uh, then it means that you have to actually acknowledge the other person. You have to see them for who they that's really right. are. You have to welcome them in their be in their own being, not as you are, or as other people around you might have been. Um, that's a, that's a risky thing, and and the, the the gift of God is that actually we're given in Christ the capacity of of a new humanity, which God actually wants to foster, which is going to make us new. I mean, that's this is there's like real work. This is the part of worship that is about work. It it's we are engaging in a work in worship that actually rewrites our narrative, that relocates our bodies, that resets our identity, right? All these things. And again, part of the reason why worship theology and the arts belong together in my mind, and that I've been so personally shaped by the Bram Center and and many voices in it, has been this kind of intersection and the way that it allows us to come to it, not because we're artists necessarily, because it's by no means as though this is about turning everybody into an artist in in any normal recognizable sense. It's that it's a release through the arts of the full humanity that we all know and share. Um, I think Angela Gorman's poetry on the day of the presidential inauguration in January was an expression of art that landed suddenly right in the middle of hot political confusion, anxiety, fear, militarism, uh, violence, etc., and right in the middle of that, this woman gets up and suddenly gives the world this unbelievable gift. And I would argue it was the most transformative part of that inauguration, and may well be one of the most enduring contributions to this next chapter. And I thought it was a magnificent expression of it, what you could call just a simple action that actually was so generative that you could, everybody could feel it, right? The internet exploded oh, it with did. responses to this. Yeah, amazing. My Instagram account was only her <laughs> for about three days after. And not just photos, but paintings of right. her, collages. Right. It was right. really quite stunning. It's amazing. How did you unpack that for three days as that was happening? What what did you, oh, where did yeah. you go? Um, I, I started over the course of the pandemic uh, with all the unrest, things like that. I, I felt really challenged and called because being a visual artist myself, I felt really challenged to seek out and follow and learn from black artists and artists of color, particularly women, because I was thinking to myself, I can't, I can't name very many women artists of color living in this contemporary world. And so I sought them out, asked people, started following. And that was actually a, a way of, processing things for me of seeing images through eyes very different than my own. And um, and that moment that you reference with the poem felt like that to me. And then the repercussions visually online um, were a very similar experience. Just all right. these different interpretations of this spark that had yes. happened in yes. our world. Yes. Amazing. Amazingly powerful. You know, Shannon, we could talk on forever about these things. I just want to say first again how grateful I am to Bill and Dee Brem for founding the Brem Center for Worship Theology and the Arts at Fuller for all the goodness that has come from it and for this new chapter that now is in your hands and in the hands of others that are sharing in the leadership of different aspects of the Brem Center. And in this moment at Fuller, we're reinventing ourselves. We're trying to reimagine church for the 21st century these ingredients that you're describing are so critical to this exercise. And I just thank you very, very much for being a guest today and for all that you've shared. God bless you and the work that's ahead. Mm. It was absolutely my pleasure. Thank you, Mark.